All right, guys, welcome. Good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to uh, boot camp. This is session number five, presentation skills. Um, just before we get started, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. I know you normally probably see Morgan. I'm our student programs coordinator. I am Dr. Tiffany Holmes. I am the executive director. I'm so happy to be here with you all this evening and here to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone to um, please remain on mute um, unless you're asking a question. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or drop it in the chat. We are recording and this recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and, and most of all, it's really important to just make sure you're engaged, paying attention. Um, and so we are really encouraging everyone to be cameras on this evening for the hour. Um, and with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Mr. James, to introduce yourself and kick us off. Thank you so much, Tiffany. So good afternoon, good evening to everyone. My name is James Jones, and I'm here on behalf of the Conference of Consulting Actuaries to present uh, this presentation on presentation skills. Um, I know that everyone's gonna be on mute. Well, let me take a step back. I'm happy to be home. Um, I have been a member of the I IABA uh, for a while when I first joined and learned about the profession way back in the day. So it's good to see how our organization has grown and this opportunity to provide boot camp uh, skills. I know that you guys, and I, I use that term generically, so apologies for misusing pronouns, but you've had a couple of sessions already around the actuarial profession and career networking, uh, basic technical skills and non-technical skills. And today's session, we will go through how to kind of package that and put it into presentations um, and, and things to consider as you're de developing, designing, and delivering presentations. I'm gonna share my screen and go into the actual deck uh, I, I don't want this to be a monologue, so please feel free to ask questions if you have them. Um, you will have access to this information afterwards as a reference guide. So if there's certain things that you wanted to kind of dive deeper on, let me know. But I really would appreciate this being more interactive and getting for you guys to get out of it what you need, right? So the level of what I'm presenting is what uh, many consulting firms present to their first year analysts as they're joining an organization. So you're kind of got to be a, a step ahead of, of what you may see uh, uh, early consultants get. So let me begin to share my screen uh, and we'll actually talk about that also as we go through this presentation. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So again, presentations around presentation skills in, in 3D, I'll get to that later. What I wanna do is kind of give a brief history though to start off with the Conference of Consulting Actuaries. So our um, website is uh, uh, ccactuaries.org, I believe, I hopefully I didn't mess that up. Uh, with, and you can see it at the bottom uh, of the screen at page two www.ccactuaries.org. What are we? We're an organization that provides quality education and facilitates networking amongst established and inspiring leaders in the actuarial consulting community. So as, um, as you become credentialed uh, in the actuarial profession, um, one of the organizations that you could potentially join would be the Conference of Consulting Actuaries. Now that doesn't mean that all of the consulting actuaries uh, work for consulting firms but we all serve our clients. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides, uh, either in an internal or an external way to provide services. And it's just an organization where we really do promote uh, um, uh, professional needs and the career success of all our consulting actuaries. On the right-hand side, you can see our, our membership in our various communities, be it our healthcare communities, our pension uh, communities, um, international, which is one of the communities that I'm very active in, uh, and, and continuing education. So similar to this boot camp, we offer continuing education to our members who are credentialed actuaries throughout the year on various topics. Uh, I also serve, serve on the board of directors of that organization and look forward uh, to, to, to continuing to uh, provide, provide um, access and, and, and leadership and just, just, it's a wonderful organization. So if you have questions about the CCA afterwards, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. 
All right, so today's agenda, we're gonna cover three things, defining the types of presentations that are normally given, how to design those presentations, and then how to deliver those presentations. Now, as we go through this, this is not a course on PowerPoint. This is actually not a course on public speaking. We'll cover some of that information, but it's really just to kind of give an overview of the types of presentations that you may see in the actuarial uh, community, what you should consider as you're designing those presentations, and then when it's time to actually deliver them, what are some things to consider? That's where the 3D came from. Yeah, I know it's corny, but I'm an actuary, so things like that happen. So that's presentation skills in 3D. Before we begin, I actually would, since we're a kind of intimate group, which I, I love, if you could in the chat, what are some of the things you would like to get out of this presentation? Would love to um, uh, see that in the chat. If you can just drop down some of your goals or objectives as you're uh, going through this of what you'd like to see. As you're writing that in, I'll continue to go through here. Uh, next, the next slide uh, kind of talks about certain things that you may see as you're going through your career or on a project, recognizing that various individuals may be your client. Again, I'm part of the Conference of Consulting Actuaries, so we're always talking in terms of our client. Those clients may be your direct, from an internal perspective or from an external perspective. The top line covers things that an internal client may be, your direct manager or your project leadership. Uh, and the bottom, you see an external client, right? So the, the client working team, the actual um, individuals that you may be working with, a client sponsor, the steering committee, and um, the client executives, right? So those are other individuals that you may see um, as you're working through various parts of a project. Um, I've also listed the various types of activities or interactions you may have with those uh, various clients. So from a director, uh, from a direct manager, you know, you may discuss your deliverables or what you're going to, to use. Uh, project leadership, you may have uh, preparation for various co uh, committees. Dealing with the external client, you know, working with various information requests or a brainstorming session with the team, et cetera. So I just wanted to kind of show you here um, various types of clients that you may see as you're moving through your career or a project. One of the things to understand as you're going into a presentation is that it's important to make sure you understand what are the objectives of the meeting or the presentation that you're doing. Is it to gather input or to get information? Are you providing a status update? Are you trying to share some information that you have or share some findings from an analysis that you did? Are you using this uh, meeting to discuss recommendations, to advance a process, or to just brainstorm and think about what are some things that we should consider? Are you using this meeting to tee up a decision that may be made later, or is this a, is this a meeting where a decision will be made? There's other reasons that you could have a meeting, but I've listed these eight here because I think it's really important, regardless of the type of project that we're doing, why are we meeting? So, right, we're talking about presentation skills. We want to understand why do we need a presentation, and it could be for one of these um, eight items. As you're thinking about those presentations, there's numerous characteristics that make your presentation effective, right? Um, what are things that it needs to be? It needs to be clear, right? Um, ensuring that everything that's there is understood by the audience and by yourself. Concise. Um, many times as we're looking at presentations, we don't have an unlimited number of, of minutes in the day, right? It's either an, uh, a set number of times. So we want to make sure we're being very straight to the point uh, of what's needed in that presentation comprehensible or understandable, right? So to make sure that the, the information that's on in your presentation can be understood by the audience. It's great if you understand it, but how do we make sure we're explaining it to the audience so that they can also uh, catch on to the concepts? Error-free. Um, you you want to make sure as you're presenting information that it doesn't have any errors. I know for us actuaries, specifically as we're getting into the numbers, we want to make sure our numbers are correct. Um, but we also want to make sure that our logic to getting to those numbers is also correct. 
Uh, that's where working with teams, having uh, someone who can help uh, review your work is extremely important. Insightful, right? To make sure we're having a, a meeting that's going to provide insights or, 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 or messaging that's not, that we haven't heard or it's providing a different perspective uh, is extremely important. And then last but not least, we have compelling. It makes the audience want to do something. Either, again, make a decision, uh, uh, tee this up for another meeting, uh, understand the insights that are being gathered, et cetera. So in order to do this, you want to make sure that you effectively execute the presentation and that is structured, practiced, and prepared. And we'll talk a little bit about that. One of the things to, to help as you're beginning to think about how you want to deliver your presentation is to use this possible structure. So headline, if I'm thinking about what, what is the purpose of this slide or the, this presentation, what is it about? Orientation, how should we read the slide? As we do in, in our language, we normally read from left to right, top to bottom. As you're designing the slide and designing what information you want to be there, ensuring that you orient it in a fashion that can be followed. To be able to explain, to go through the key elements, the key process, the key um, uh, uh, concepts and numbers and, and, and methods in your presentation, to be able to explain them uh, is extremely important. And then finally, you see the so what or transition. So at the, at what's the summary of the slide? What is the purpose you, you, that we need to do and how do you transition to the next one? One of the things I normally say when I'm working on a presentation or with any concept and specifically us as actuaries, it's very complex, but we should make sure that at some point as we're going through this, we can explain it to our cousin or someone at the family reunion, someone who's not in our field. If we can explain certain concepts to them in that type of manner, that means we're, it, it's, it's, it's comprehensible and that it's understandable. I think many times we'll get caught up in some of our lingo and some of our wording where it's like, I have no idea what you just said. That's not what you want for a presentation. You wanna make sure it meets your audience where they are. One way to do that is to communicate the message and drive the discussion is to use a framework similar to this where um, I, I almost look at it for, as an outline form. So I know in, in school, we use a lot of outlines to, to organize our work. Um, ensuring that you have the main message or the main thesis around what the presentation is about. The storyline, which is the high level ideas, I, as you can see here, idea A or idea B and then the various evidence to support each one of those storylines. Again, I try to think of this as an outline form. And I, I do that because many times as we're uh, presenting information, depending on the audience, they may only need the storyline. They may only need a, the storyline and a little bit of the supporting evidence. Or you may be talking to a colleague or someone else who's really into the technical aspect of it. And so they need all the further evidence that you have. Be prepared for any presentation to make sure that it fits the needs of your audience, be it the high level ideas, the supporting evidence, or the further evidence. This part of our um, presentation really talks about um, setting the context and, and various things to consider. Um, you'll see if you ever uh, go on, online, uh, something called the Mento Principle. M-I-N-T-O, which is used by a lot of analysts in the consulting world, not just actuaries, but uh, 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 analysts and consultants in, in other organizations. And it, it really helps to kind of set the, set the sequence of how to address uh, any, type of, any type of situation or, or, or challenge as you're doing a presentation. So you'll see an agenda. And from that agenda, there's this, what was the situation that you're describing? So kind of giving uh, a setup of here's what we're talking about. Here's the complication or the thing that makes this situation unique. Here's the key question that we're trying to answer. Here's our hypothesis of that answer, why we believe that the assertion, the facts to support that assertion and the next step. So as you can see here, there's this methodology of <clears throat> how you would address 
uh, a presentation before you go into a Q&A aspect um, to, to help um, set the stage. However, for some presentations, you may not have time or setting up the situation may be a little bit distracting from the message. So many times it's um, going in answer first and you start off with what is the key question that we're trying to answer? And then what is the hypothesis? I will pause there for a minute. Many times it is very difficult to get people to switch um, this order from hypothesis, what we believe the answer is, why we believe that answer and the facts to support it. Many times we naturally wanna say, here's the question, here are all the facts. Let me go the other way because I forget I'm looking at a mirror. Here's the facts and then here's the answer. But in, in, in consulting and specifically uh, for many of our clients, you wanna start with the answer. It is okay to give the answer first and then how you got to the answer. Let me pause here. Um, I do want to uh, allow anyone if they have questions to come off mute um, before we go into our next section. Um, but are there any questions so far over the information that we, I've shared? All right, let me keep going there. So regardless of the format, presentations normally have the, the following elements. There's normally an agenda um, in which we try to align on what our discussion points are, the objectives of the presentation, what are the outcomes, are we here to make decisions or take action items, an executive summary, which is normally one or two pages that summarize the key, level, the key uh, takeaways of the session, the actual body and content. So this may be your analysis, um, other things to help drive the discussion and then always ending with next steps. Um, regardless of the presentation, this is normally kind of what you see. Um, and again, you start off with the agenda. Why are we meeting? What's the big idea number three? If I only have two minutes for the presentation, what are the two things that I need to know? And then four going into the actual body of the uh, of the presentation and any supporting information. There's a fundamental of storytelling here that I kind of wanted to walk through um, that, that goes through uh, four swim lanes and some other items on what every presentation does. And again, if you're not familiar with the storytelling concept, it's very similar to stories that you were told in in, in as a child or moving or watching on television, right? If we think about those uh, dramas and comedies, you know, once upon a time, uh, but no, we're not doing that for, for actuarial uh, information, but making sure that you start with the three preparation steps, identifying the objectives of the presentation, who our audience is, and how long the conversation should be, telling the story, again, having your answer first, then going and following up with your supporting facts, any implications for the client, and then anything that you would see that's important for them to have in an appendix, right? So a lot of details in presentations um, may be in an appendix versus being in the body of the presentation. Um, one of the key skills is to understand what data should be in the body and what data can be in an appendix. Again, um, you wanna make sure your presentation fits your audience. The pyramid principle, number three here, in which again, I talked about the MINTO principle, M-I-N-T-O, or the pyramid principle. We can do a whole session on that, but I think it's important um, to, to afterwards look at that information. Again, leveraging an outline type um, uh, uh, methodology of how to tell the story. And then finally, looking at how your structure is. Is it following a logical structure in which you have your principal message and then anything supporting it, which is preferred in storytelling? Or is it a linear presentation where it's step one, two, three, and four? Again, this is slightly different than maybe uh, the type of way you've, you've told stories before. Um, one of the things that I look at uh, individuals who are coming into the field and coming into uh, this presentation type um, uh, of work, it's, it's a challenge. Again, I go back to the, the second line of putting the answer first. Um, many times you want to go with the fact base and the how we got there versus putting the answer first. Uh, I would say 
um, one of the things, key, key things of success is being able to, to do that. This slide here kind of tells the, the way to adjust your storyline and structure based on your audience, right? So if you see the between the size of the audience, the format and the style and structure, you can see if you have a meeting of more than eight people, um, you probably wanna make sure you have a high level executive summary so that it can be easily digestible to the different types of people who you may have. Um, the style is really oral, making sure that it's clear and simple. Why? We have a lot of people on the call uh, or in the meeting and wanna make sure that everyone gets out of it, uh, the purpose and the objective of the meeting. If you have a meeting between three and eight people, you can be a little bit more personalized and, and, and focus on uh, some of the details uh, that, that may be needed. So if I think about uh, some of the key stakeholders in, in from a finance perspective or HR, I, I want to make sure I'm hitting those individuals. I may put a little bit more detail in my presentation for those clients. You still want to focus on the oral presentation and make sure your storyline is structured properly. But it also has uh, this type of presentation, has a lot of explanation slides so you can go into the details. Last but not least, on the right-hand side, you can see the document released to one or two people. This is something that you can be very detailed in uh, with, with analysis. And because you're really sharing it with one or two folks, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be as broad in general. You can go into a lot more detail. Here, it's really focused on the written presentation versus just being able to orally tell the story. As you're building a presentation, you can think about the types of slides that need to be built um, and, and according to the time frame in which you're working on it. So in many of our um, meetings and sessions, we may have a kickoff meeting in which we're kicking off a project with the client. You may have a weekly check-in to provide status and updates uh, with the client. You may have working sessions where you're gonna dive deep into uh, some of the analysis and brainstorm into how we're going to get some of the work done. Alignment sessions to kind of show our progress uh, based off of certain projects and how we're gonna align on, on next steps. And then finally on the right, you can see the readouts, right? So um, some of the final presentations uh, that would be given to a client. The formality you can see uh, kickoff is very formal. Um, the weekly check-in and working sessions may not be as formal because you wanna use those to, to brainstorm and get ideas. Uh, the alignment sessions are also gonna be slightly formal, but the readout, because it's the final product and most likely going to the client executive would be, would be very formal. The duration of most of these meetings, as you can see, varies between 30 minutes to one hour, possibly two, depending on the, the time and, and the objectives that needs to be that need to happen. If you need to go more than one hour, again, I would consider um, making sure that your topic is only limited to one hour. So there are many times that there are four hour meetings that may happen, but really if you look at them, they're four one hour meetings. Um, with different topics and allows people to break. Again, I don't think from a mental capacity that staying focused on something for four hours straight is something that, um, that, that we've done. And so you wanna make sure you allow that time for your brain to digest what it's heard and to be able to um, put, put, put enough time into the effort. The last line here, you can see there's approximately 10 slides to around 20 slides to support uh, the, inf the support the information that's being delivered, uh, with the exception being these uh, the the last two in which uh, for an alignment session it may be less, and then for the final readout it may be a little bit more. As you're designing a slide, um, there's a couple of things to consider, right? And and the right hand slide really the right hand side really does kind of uh, summarize what this is. What is the main message of the slide? So if I look at the title, what are we trying to accomplish here? Ensuring that that title is descriptive and action oriented. Does it need a subtitle or something else to support it? That second item may not be, be needed, uh, but you definitely wanna make sure your title uh, is something that describes this is what this slide is trying to say. 
what's the actual context of the slide? So the evidence, the data, it could be a chart, it could be diagram, it could be bullet points. This is the actual body of the slide. Is there anything to call out? Is there anything specific? So you can see the call out box feature that's there, something to draw attention to the specific points or categories. And then at the bottom, you can see if we're making any notes or um, for any assumptions that are made or sourcing where we've gotten some information. So where do we get this data from? These are main components of any type of presentation or any slide that you're describing. And hopefully as you're hearing me, I haven't talked a lot about the type of presentation. So I haven't said an actuarial valuation report. I haven't talked about uh, presenting the, the results to a finance committee. This is, these concepts can be applied to any type of presentation, be it actuarial or non-actuarial in nature. And I think it's important that we as actuaries kind of recognize, yes, there's that technical component of what we do, but we also need to be able to describe those technical things in non-technical terms. And that's kind of what we're doing here as we're going through this presentation skills to kind of think through um, what are some general ways of presenting this information. In order to make sure that the slide is fluid, you want to ensure that there's one message per slide, right? Um, you don't want to put 25 different messages on one slide because it gets really busy and it, it loses its impact. You want to make sure your slide is unique, it's concise, simple, and action-oriented, right? And, and I'll go back, I'll, I'll kind of get to that, that second and third, the concise and simple. Again, many times, we want to use a lot of words or have a lot of information and, and that's it's a challenge to read that type of stuff or if we have 25 charts on a slide it, it may be hard to follow if there's not someone to kind of take you through each step um, many times i try to make sure the messages that i put out and the the presentations that i'm defining are are simple so that if i don't say anything if you read the slide you understood the message and I think as you're kind of designing your presentations or uh, giving a presentation, you want to try to keep it as simple as you can. Recognizing that sometimes the concepts are going to be very complex, but being very simple and clear and concise will help you tremendously. Finally, I've put together this checklist of things as you're building a slide, you know, um, things to consider as you're as you're putting something together. Now, again, this is not a session on PowerPoint. This is not a session on um, uh, uh, slide design. There are other sessions that can go into a lot more detail. But overall, looking at your tagline uh, or your headline, is it is it accurate? Does it get to the point? Uh, the overall format of the slide, does it look pretty? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, uh, overly busy, but the, is it attractive? Is it clean? Uh, your charts, are your data, is your data correct? Are the titles correct? Does it make sense? Again, with the numbers, do the numbers make sense? Do they tie into other numbers that you may have on different other slides sides, uh, in the deck? The text, is the grammar and spelling correct? Again, one thing I would say is make sure you run spell check and you read the slide, right? Many times we say, oh, let's just run spell check and uh, Microsoft will do what it needs to do. But I think it's also important to take a step back and actually read the slide. Many times you'll see that there may be some, chat, some, uh, some errors that spell check didn't catch. The font, making sure that it's the uh, consistent size and a consistent color. And then if you need to source any information, uh, making sure that you do that. So before I get into um, the actual delivery and the communication, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. If I can get to the technology, stop sharing. Uh, there it is, stop sharing. And I want to open it up to this group. Any questions so far? And don't worry, I will call names. I have a question. Yes. Um, yeah, hi. Hey. I wanted to know, um, it's about presentation skills. I wanted to know, like, when we are doing a presentation, um, do you 
suggest that we put more words in these slides or more like graphical things and like keywords? I would say it depends. Um, it's going to depend on uh, the audience of who you're delivering to. Uh, it also depends on what the message is. For some individuals, they prefer more graphics. I'm going to say graphics versus pictures. But if I think of visual effects, some people prefer that. Others, if I'm leaving something behind, I may leave more words because they can read it at their leisure. I think it really does depend on the objective of the presentation and who your audience is. So I'm never going to say, oh, it should all only be text. It should be a balance, right? It kind of is like a balanced meal. I can't just eat all beef. I kind of need to have some vegetables too. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for asking the question. Other questions? I also have a question, um, yeah. Mohammed. Um, you did say that um, the slide should be um, in such a way that if somebody picks the slides, the person reads the slides, um, the person can understand. But then um, my question is that, um, wouldn't that make the slides like you'd have so many words on that and then like kind of like I thought maybe if you are present, you should have maybe bullets on like on your slide so you could be able to talk more. So I'm kind of like confused on like what to do, because if you have bullets, then if somebody picks them, it's, unless the person's in the field, maybe the person might find it a bit difficult to understand. I, to I totally understand the question and can see where there might be confusion. I think what I would say is there's a way that you can put bullets that aren't full sentences and not a lot of words and still get the point across, right? So if you look at the slides, and I'll make sure you have this presentation, even without me saying anything, if you were to pick this up, you could read this and understand the key points of what's going on, right? The fact that I'm talking about it doesn't, doesn't take away from it. You could still kind of get the basic concept. I think it's important, though, that and we'll talk about this in the next session of delivery, you've noticed I've not read the slides, right? I've, I've, I've provided information over the slides, but I'm comfortable enough that I know what's on the slide, that I'm not there to read each line, but there's enough there that if I don't say anything and just allow you the opportunity to read, you would get the concept. So I, I say that as we go with any presentation. Sometimes as we talk about our actual concepts, it may be a little, difficult, but I still think it's doable. And, and many of our actuarial uh, uh, colleagues have done this, where they have put the results on the presentation, they put the how they got to the results in the presentation, and it's still not a whole bunch of words. This is a difference between the presentation and a report. A report and Excel analysis and all that is something very different than presenting the results to a committee. Am I making sense? Awesome. Great questions. What other questions we got? Uh, hello. Good morning. Uh, we'll go with Michael first, then Lois. So Lois, I heard you. We're going to go with Michael first. OK. Um, so my question is, so based on the answer you give, Mohammed, there is a difference between a report and an actual presentation. And I would love it if you would able to share with us because personally, I'm not in the actuarial field. I'm currently working with an NGO, and I would like to know the difference between an actuarial evaluation report and a presentation. So that's my first question. And my second question is, you, you shared with us a lot of information and insight, and it's, a, it's very detailed. So meaning, in order to present, you have to prepare very well. You, know, you, have, to think, you have to think everything through. And, is there some kind of if uh, some kind of unknown variable that might affect my may affect your presentation? Let's say you've you've done all your preparations all right, but is there something that may affect your presentation you are not aware of? Okay, so I'm going to answer that in two ways. The first one was your question around the actuarial report versus a presentation. Um, the easiest way for me to describe this is a Word document versus a PowerPoint document. Think of the Word document as an actuarial report that's going to have a lot of different pages and details, right? The presentation is something that is at a high level summarizing what's in the report, but it provides a high level uh, summary so that you, if you didn't read the report, 
you still understand what's going on. I don't know if any of you uh, uh, have surfed YouTube, but for some reason I do that. And there's this thing called Man of Recaps, where they, where it's one guy who recaps a whole season of a series in like five to 10 minutes, right? And to me, the recap is the presentation where he's saying all the high points. The report is binging all 10 episodes of a series. Make sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. I'm going to answer your second question in the next section when we talk about if you uh, get a question that you can't answer, what things to consider. We'll talk about in that, that in the delivery session if you'll let me hold that question. Cool? Okay. Okay. All right. Lois, you're up. Okay, so I've heard a lot of people say um, consulting, actuarial consulting, and just consulting in general is just um, a lot of slide deck presentations, especially in your first year of being on the job. What are your views on that? <laughs> so it's interesting. All of my career, I've been a consultant. And I would say that um, slide decks are extremely important as a consultant because not everyone's going to take the time to read the report. But that analysis is still something that is deep in our hearts, right? Deep in our technical skills of what we do. So I won't say that your whole life as a consultant is PowerPoint by death. No, we're not doing that. But, but PowerPoint and presentation skills and slide decks are extremely important. Why? You may only have 15 minutes with the client. You may only have 10 minutes with the client. What are the three things that you want the client to know? in a short time, and then if they need more details to go somewhere else, right? So I think sometimes, especially in consulting, it's the reverse. Many times we say, oh, you have the book. If you want the summary later, we'll give it to you. In consulting, it really is the reverse. And I'm saying consulting, not just because I've worked for consulting companies, but because my manager is a, cons I'm a consultant to my manager as a client. I'm a consultant to uh, other clients. It's not just necessarily being part of a consulting firm versus being part of an insurance company. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah. All right, I like the question. What else we got? I know we got a little bit more time. I, I, I will make sure we, we cover the message. Any other can you I can hear you. I just want to confirm, how do you face challenges, especially say you're trying to um, present an answer that I usually say in a triangle format. However, in your slides so far, you have what you have designed looks more like a table or a chart will be, will be, it will be sufficient, it will be appropriate. How do you balance? If, how about I'm just saying that, how do you balance say, the result of your answer in a particular format? And uh, the, your slide, you are already given a constraint to provide the results in a particular format. Say a triangle versus says they just pass a bar chart only. So I, I'm apologizing, Yusuf. I, I think I have a bad connection. Can you repeat your question once again? Saying that, how do you balance, let's say, if your result of your analysis or what you have done is in like a triangle format? So if the result of your analysis is? In a triangle format, for example, let's say you are doing a quick loss ratio and you're doing 28 um, issue year versus um, versus the, the claim year, policy issue year versus policy claim year. But um, the slide you are doing, you are trying to present, um, the results are mandated to be, say, in a bar chart format. That you're plotting your year, how do you manage that if the chart you are required to provide and the result does not totally match? How do you manage that? So I think you're you're speaking around the types of charts to use and if it doesn't if your results don't match. Is that is that where your question is? Yes. So I would say again, if you look at what I've I've shown, I've not gone into technical details of how to build a chart. Or, um, or some of the, the mathematics that we would go through as actuaries. I think that's another conversation. What I will say to answer your question is to ensure that you know what is the story. So I've done all these trials. I've gotten this data. I've built this chart. What is the purpose of this chart? What is the answer it's trying to tell? And how does that answer the beginning, the overall question of the presentation of why we're doing it? 
that's that's what I would say as I'm as you're going through it. One, you're going to have to make sure your numbers are correct. That's just something that goes uh, with the territory, right? And you work with the team to make sure your numbers are correct. But it's to understand what is the story that I'm trying to tell. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right, let me go back to sharing my screen and we can talk about delivery. All right, so a couple of fundamental, uh-oh, a couple of fundamental views on, on, on effective communication. Before you go into any meeting, right, make sure that you are thinking about it from your audience's perspective, right? What is your audience or your client wanting to get out of this meeting or out of this project. I, the note I've put here is that what's interesting or insightful to you may not necessarily be what the audience is looking for. So making sure you understand what's in it for them, having a clear understanding of what success is and make your materials uh, an extension of what you want to say. It's more of what is the message that I want to get over to my client, not oh, I'm gonna prepare all these materials and hopefully I'll figure out what to say. It's being prepared before you go into the meeting uh, on, on what that message is. As you're in the meeting, make sure you recognize, we always talk too fast and too long. So you wanna make sure you're slowing down uh, to ensure that people can hear you, to make sure that you have enough time to formulate your own thoughts. Um, are there any tricks that you need to help you when it's time to think off the cuff? Um, I know there were some questions that were asked as if someone asks you uh, a, a very difficult question, what are some things to do? Um, one is to be quiet and wait. I think many times the pause is very effective for us to gather our thoughts and the audience will recognize that you're gathering your thoughts. The other is to say, hey, Great question, let me get back to you on that. I think many times our audiences are fine with us going back and getting some answers if we don't have it right then and there. Many times we feel like we have to answer everything right there and that's not necessarily the case. Now, if there are three questions that are asked back to back and you, and you have to, for all three questions, say, let me get back to you, then maybe there's not alignment on what the meeting was, the objectives of the meeting. Right, so you want to make sure you're balancing that um, again to 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 answer the objectives of the meeting and to provide that information. A couple of things to prepare, regardless of what kind of setting or what kind of presentation you're giving. Prepare. Um, this was mentioned a little bit earlier, but when you walk into your presentation, you should know what's on the slide. You should know what the overall objective is. Uh, I tell many of my team members all the time, before we go into a meeting, we've actually already played the meeting out in our head. It may not go exactly how we prepare, but at least we have that first point of, okay, here's what I anticipate would happen in the meeting. Here's the messages that I'm going to give out. Here's the questions that I may expect. That preparation is extremely important. I'll jump down to part three, slow down. Make sure when you're speaking that you speak in an appropriate speed, not too fast, not too slow. I know over the last three years, many of us have had to use um, technology in order to do our presentations. And it's allowed some of us to recognize, wow, I really speak too fast or I may speak too slow. Just something to consider as you're giving your presentation skills. And I'm, I'm gonna pause right here to talk about you know, many times folks are like, oh, I don't feel, I feel like I'm being fake as I'm, as I'm giving the presentation. I'm not, I'm using big words and I, th that's not who I am. My recommendation as you're going through this, be your authentic self as you're presenting. It is okay to speak with an accent. I'm originally from Texas and I, my Southern accent comes out many times. It's okay to speak in your, um, in the manner in which you speak, regardless of verb conjugations, et cetera, as long as you are uh, in making sure that the presentation is being uh, understood. Many times I've had to present uh, materials in another language that isn't my native language. 
And I know that I'm not fluent in that language, but I am sure that I speak at a speed in which between the slide and my speaking, the audience understands the point and are able to ask questions uh, and respond. And I, I think it doesn't have to be perfect. It needs to be understandable. Um, looking, uh, I'll jump to number five, looking around and seeing who you react presenting to, understand what their reactions are. Reading the room is important. Um, it's, it's, I'm trying to do that here in a technology aspect as I see all of you on Zoom and I'm looking at the various, those of you who are on camera to see, are you nodding? Do you get it? And if, if you don't, making sure we go back to that, uh, those, present, those points. Um, point number seven, highlighting the key points instead of reading the slide verbatim. Slide point number eight, being prepared to answer questions and to let the discussion evolve. I think many times we say, oh, I have a script. I'm going to go through my script and then I'm going to answer any questions that may come. For some aspects of your presentation, that's the approach. But many times it's a discussion. You want to bring your client along and your client, again, being your manager or an external client so that it's a dialogue, not a monologue. Last but not least, if for those who are using technology, if you're using Skype or Teams or other things, you want to make sure you have Do Not Disturb while you're presenting. Now, I say that as number nine, as I've had a couple of things pop up, but you know, sometimes things happen, and from a technology perspective, you still have to manage that. Um, some other thoughts uh, between presenting in person or presenting remotely. Um, in person, recognize that there's no mute button. Uh, and, and so you wanna make sure uh, that if you're working with teammates that you orchestrate any handoffs. You wanna read the body language in the room and the nonverbal cues. So again, looking at those individuals who you're presenting to and seeing, do they understand it? Many times they'll let you know by a smile or a head nod. Or if you see a perplexed look, you, you, you could stop and say, uh, I want to take a pause. Are there any questions here? Um, was that point clear? Having that will really help as you're um, uh, building a relationship. I know we had the session on networking and the LinkedIn profile. I really call networking part of building relationships. And, and from that relationship, you'll be able to understand uh, if your message got across or if there's still some things you need to do. On the right hand side, for those of us who are pretty presenting remotely, you know, um, there is a mute button, but you want to make sure you're, you're using it properly. The same way of going on and off camera, making sure you use it properly. Uh, you want to summarize clearly. And then when the meeting is ready to end, you want to make sure everyone is aligned. Hey, I think we've covered everything. Is it okay to end the meeting? Um, that helps because it helps bring the meeting to a start and to a close. Presentations normally are given in one of three settings, either in person, virtual, sort of like what we're doing now, or over the phone. Um, I think as we've, over the last three years, we've seen more meetings such as this one become more virtual. Um, phone meetings still occur, so I'm gonna cover that because if there's a meeting in which you're not having video, you wanna kind of use some of the concepts we have here on the phone. Here's some best practices that we have, you know, in all meetings, you want to test the tools that you use, be it a microphone, be it your computer, be it Zoom, be it the technology, um, to make sure you're being heard, the camera, so you can be seen, uh, ensuring that you've, you've tested that technology out. And, you know, making sure you have internet connection. Many times over the pandemic, over the last three years, uh, in the middle of a meeting, Comcast or other uh, internet providers may have an outage. What do you do and how do you ensure that you keep your technology working? Uh, uh, under virtual, you know, we say familiarizing yourself with the technology. Um, we, we've all learned, you know, sitting in front of the camera, looking at the camera, having lights to make sure you're seen, eliminating any background noise uh, that may occur. And then from a phone, and again, some of these can be used um, all through, in, in either type of setting, make sure you send the materials in advance. Um, I know we will have the materials afterwards, um, so you can have it as reference. Pause for any questions to make sure you uh, are bringing the audience along in your presentation and, and the comments. This slide talks about a variety of delivery aids that can be used, you know, between PowerPoint, flip charts, whiteboards, um, other technologies, and the benefit that they can provide 
um, because the first thing, some people learn more uh, verbally versus uh, re re writing, right? So some people are uh, audio learners, some people are visual learners. Uh, to ensure that you support the learning objective, uh, stimulate interest and keep the audience engaged. Last but not least, as we're going through this, we wanna make sure that people, the presentation is great, but people are always gonna remember you as the presenter. They may not necessarily remember the content, but they'll always remember you as the presenter and that is part of the relationship building. Um, and last, decks are tools that enable the presenter to do their job and convey the best message. But again, it always goes back to the people. So this is, the end of my presentation, but I did want to leave time for other Q&A that you may have related to um, presentation skills. We have a couple of minutes left before top of the hour and there's some announcements that we'll make, but I definitely wanna open the floor up to you for any questions that you may have on this topic or anything else that, you, that comes to mind. I'm really happy to see all 20 of you here, y'all make my heart smile just seeing y'all. So I'll open any questions. Uh, I know a lot of the learning that you do is on the, on the job, but what can we do now as students to prepare ourselves for um, presenting in our company? So great question, great question. And I would say things to do now, things that are being, taught in this boot camp are extremely important. So, you know, those basic technical skills, you know, passing the exams and getting that stuff done, that's important. But the non-technical skills, ensuring that, you know, your, your PowerPoint skills is, is, is up to par and your Excel skills and, and knowing how to use the technology. I think many times, and I know resume writing is something in the future that we have, but as I'm interviewing uh, candidates, I just ask them questions about what they put on their resume. If you say you're proficient in Excel, you should be able to say five, form, five uh, functions that exist in Excel. People hear that question like, oh my God, I don't know what a function is. You know what a function is. Take the time and breathe and then go through some of the functions, sum, average. If the, be able to talk about your experiences and comfortable in, in, in saying that out loud. That's something I would say to start with now. Be authentically you as the other one. Don't try to be anyone else because you are the best you and companies need you. This uh, diverse uh, mindset and neurodiversity as well as other diversity is extremely important to companies now. Don't try to be someone else, be the best you. Hopefully that answers some of the things. I can talk about more, but- Yeah, it does. <laughs> that's really good advice. All right, Michael, I see you wrote, raise your hand, come on. Oh, okay, so my question is somehow related to the previous one. Okay. So during presentation, I usually, I'm, I'm always anxious during presentation. So what I do is I usually memorize what I'm going to present. So that's what works for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I wanted to ask if there's any techniques I might use or something you do during presentation or before presentation that helps you a lot. And if you will share some of these techniques with me. So I, I can give you my experiences, right? So I grew up uh, in, in, in an environment where giving a presentation or getting in front of an audience was something I had to do on a weekly basis. So I, I tell people as I'm not, I'm the consultant who I am now and the public speaker who I am because I've had years of experience as a child to say my Christmas speech, my Easter speech, to sing solo, so being in front of an audience for me is a little bit easier. I would also say I give myself permission to mess up. And so if I'm trying to memorize and be perfect, there are events that can happen in your delivery that you're gonna, something may happen, right? So allow yourself enough uh, grace that, hey, here's what I want to do, but if I forget something, here's the three things I just need to make sure I'm doing. And I always go to three or five. I'm not trying to get everything perfect. I think that is important, but more than more overall is to practice and prepare. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm a musician and I'm looking at my piano there. I can't play a song for an audience if I haven't practiced it. I could, but it's not going to be, you know, at the level of being a concert if I don't take that time and practice. So I think that's extremely important. Hopefully that helps. But I would say, take a deep breath. Give yourself grace to um, if something happens, but don't, don't overly stress yourself. I, I'm also a person who can memorize, but if I think about each line, something's going to happen. I'm going to forget a line or someone's, I, I just don't want to put myself at that risk. So I just want to make sure I understand the high level and then I can go from there. But you got to practice it. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Cool. Brenda, I see you have your hand up. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Um, I wanted to ask a question in reference to the top skills you feel are necessary to be an actuary. I know you said to be your authentic self. What do you recommend um, as some of the top skills to have for being an actuary, particularly a consulting actuary that's international? So I would say one, the, the table stakes of being a problem solver and the mathematics aspect of it, that's, you, you got to do that, right? So you got to be able to solve the problems, pass the exams and all of that good stuff. I think for, for, for me and others is to be able to recognize what is your superpower and how do you help your client with that superpower? For me, it's presentation skills. And it's also being able to think broad. But for some people, they need that actuary who's extremely precise and knows that the number is 2.6854. That's not necessarily James's strength. He can do that. But his strength is to be able to tell the client, hey, here's how we got to the number. And here's what that number means for you. So I think depending on what role you're going for, recognize what is your superpower to help you in that role. These are some good questions. I know we're at top of the hour, but I, we can go a couple more minutes if needed. I had another question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, don't, so, don't apologize. So okay. rule number zero, don't apologize. This is a safe space. Ask your questions. Okay. So this is not in reference to presentations, but you had mentioned that you just got back and that you travel, in a, travel internationally. Um, can you give some more details about your specific role as a consulting actuary? and for how long you travel and where you've been? So I, I can tell you where I am now, where I have been and where I started. So when I first started in the profession, I didn't do a lot of traveling. I stayed in the office. I did very traditional work, but I always wanted the opportunity to do more. And because of the firm that I was with and the superpower that I had, people were able to find, we were able to find opportunities for me to be able to do more. Part of that brought, uh, brought me to a space of mergers and acquisitions and how to help companies go through a uh, merger and acquisition or a divestiture or any type of transaction. Um, in doing so, I also knew how to speak Spanish and Portuguese. So because of that, I ended up fitting a gap that existed at a company where, hey, we need someone who understands from an American concept what the companies do, but can explain it uh, in another language, right? And so I'll never say that I'm fluent in Spanish and Portuguese, but I've had to be able to present in those languages and I'm fluent enough that the concepts that we're discussing um, uh, are understood. So for doing that, in order to do that, you kind of got to be over in Latin America. So I spent a lot of time in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Now in this part of my career since the pandemic, I really have been a little bit more local and with the technology, you don't necessarily have to travel anymore. So, so I would say it's slowed down a bit, but I still love that. And part of it also is in my personal life, I love to travel. So again, recognizing what your superpower is and to be able to apply it to a company and to a situation. There's always gonna be uh, opportunities out there. They may come at a different time, but be ready for the opportunity when it exists. Other questions? Yeah, and I have a question. It's unrelated to um, presentation, but just going based off of your answer um, from Brenda's question. 
um, just what made you stay in consulting for so long? I mean, why are you still in consulting? Because I know a lot of people would just like be in consulting for two years and exit um, because probably because of the work hours and whatnot. So. So again, I, I hear I get this often and I look at how long I've been in consulting and it's like, well, wait, what were you thinking? For some people, that is who they are. So if I look back and I see the type of person that I was even before I started working, I always wanted to kind of solve problems and help people. So that's kind of what consultants do. With my life and my work-life integration, I'm going to say integration, not necessarily balance, I am able to uh, adjust and, 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 and carry the workload of what consulting is. So, oh, it's long hours, oh, it's this. It is, but I like that, right? So for me, it works. For some people, it doesn't, and I recognize that. Um, so I wanna make sure, you know, I, I wanna make sure consultants get a, get a good rep. I recognize that sometimes the hours are long, but for people who want to do it, it's, it's a great way it's a great career. I've done it now for over 25 years, and I can't see myself doing anything else but consulting. And I recognize some of my colleagues are like, no, this was enough. I got what it from I, I got from it what I needed, and I'm able to move on. I recognize that. Also, for me, even though I'm in consulting, I have never done the same job for the last 20 something years. It's always been something new. Right. I mentioned the type of work I was doing when I first joined, where I didn't travel, the type of work that I was doing as I traveled, and that type of work I'm doing now has always continued to evolve, and I like that. So for me, it works. That makes sense. And this is probably the most positive I've heard anybody ever speak about consulting. That means we got, a lot I, of that means I got to do better at getting more consultants to talk to my group. <laughs> you, got some, you got some um, recruiting to do, Mr. Yeah, Young. I got to get more of my consultants <laughs> over here today. All right, one more question, and I know we've been over, but I, I do want to make sure we allow enough time. Any other questions? All right, if not, I'm going to share my screen one last time to kind of go through uh, next steps. We went through Q&A, so um, thank you for attending this Boots Camp session. I believe there's two other sessions that are coming up shortly, the next one uh, later this month on exams and education. And then in May, there'll be a session around resume writing. Both are great topics. Again, the exams and education, the changes that are being made in the education system is extremely important. And then resume writing, as you're looking at um, how do you uh, sell yourself to an organization? What are the things that you need to make sure they know you can do? And, 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 and um, your experience is extremely important to document that and put it in a way that's compelling for organizations to want to talk to you. And then we have our speaker series on April 12th in which uh, we're calling all credentialed actuaries who are interested in exploring ways to build wealth. I know that'll be a great session to, to hear next week uh, around uh, building wealth specifically within our community. Um, before I let you go, I wanna turn it back over to Tiffany. Is there anything else that we'd like to share with the group? Yes, I have some very specific instructions from Miss um, Morgan, but I just wanted to go back to Michael's question about or his comment about um, memorizing everything that he's going to say. Something that I do, and um, I've been, I'm, I'm pretty old, y'all. I'm 48, so I've been doing lots of things for a long time, and presenting is one of the things that I think is the one thing that I did not lean into um, readily. Um, and so one of the things that I do is I, when I create presentations, I put my key points, things that I wanna really nail home in the notes section of my PowerPoint. And I make sure I print out a copy with the notes section um, there. And I always have it in my hand. So, you know, as I'm going through, I just wanna make sure I am hitting on those main points and not forgetting the message that I'm trying to drive home. Because, you know, as much as I don't necessarily, it's not my superpower at all, Mr. Jones. And so, but once I start and I get going, I get going, right? And so, but I wanna make sure I, I stay, 
stay on track and I'm, I'm nailing it home. And I do practice and I have a daughter, she's 14. And so, you know, when I have a big presentation or a training or something for a big group, I am home practicing, 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 practicing. So usually I'll have the notes in my hand as like a security blanket and never really need to like go back to it. But I just wanted to throw that out there. I'd like to add on to that if you don't mind. And I, again, I'm looking at time, but listen, we could talk about this all day. <laughs> topic. I think div- delivering things virtually has actually helped. So one of the things yeah. that I do, <clears throat> I don't have it now, but each, I would get the old fashioned note cards mm-hmm. and actually have them here to the slide. So as I'm going through each slide, I have my note card here that says, again, three bullets. What are the three things that I need to say? I yeah. don't have the slide memorized, but there's three points. What are those points that I need to make on each slide? I think that's one. And yeah. two, again, I go back to re- looking at the camera, making that eye contact. Um, I'm not a Hollywood guy, but I think a lot of the techniques that are done in television and movies really can apply to delivering presentations virtually. Looking at the camera, taking your time, smiling, pausing and having your notes at out, outside of you that you can look at. No one's gonna say, hey, what are you doing? What are you reading? If you have your notes, it's fine. Even if I'm in a physical presentation and I have notes, it's fine if I'm referencing them. If I'm reading them, that's a different yeah. story. That's right, that's right. Thank you for that. And thank you all for, uh, Michael's raising his hand. Michael's gonna ask these questions. Come on, Michael, let's go. <laughs> you gotta ask these questions. <laughs> So there's not a question. So um, I was hoping if you could share uh, Mr. Jones's presentation with us so that we can read more about, about the various types of presentation and all those skills. So absolutely, I will share my presentation with uh, Ms. Tiffany and she can send it out to the group. I'm also, if you want, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I can't say that I got a job for you, <laughs> but I also will say that it's okay. great, but I, that, that it's also good to connect and talk. I'm always open for questions. Don't hesitate to reach out. I think being part of this organization is that you have a plethora of talent uh, and, and different perspectives that you can get. Again, I talked about my superpowers, but if I think about some of my colleagues, they are fantastic at other things that I just don't do use this organization to match and determine, oh, I really like what um, John Robinson does. I really understand what Stafford Thompson does. I really like to connect with with others um, and and their superpowers and and to understand their career and things that they've done or some of the advice. Don't be afraid to reach out and make those connections in this organization. I believe that's the session. There's a session around um, using your LinkedIn profile, right, to network. All right, guys, I do have some. um, So the animal of the day is giraffe. Um, Session attendance form for module four closes at midnight today, tonight, this evening, and module five will be due on April 19th. Be on the lookout for the follow-up email from Morgan. um, And then the last thing is we'll close out. Thank you for hanging out with us for an hour and 11 minutes. Um, Mr. Jones, your your presentation was informative. I appreciate you um, and everyone have a great, great night. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, have a great night. You too. Or day, if it's day for you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, and we'll, we'll send out that presentation deck for everyone, okay? Sure, perfect.